Good afternoon, everyone. This is Justin Pierce and Danielle Bolger. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our webinar. It's being hosted and brought to you by the National Bar Association's Intellectual Property Section. Uh, our title of our webinar today is Protecting Brand Value and Identity in the E-Commerce Space. Thanks for joining. I am Justin Pierce from the law firm of Venable. I practice in all areas of IP. Uh, primarily, my personal practice is sort of a combination of patent litigation, and I do a lot of work and have done a lot of work both at the firm and also in in-house roles in the areas of brand protection, uh, trademark, uh, copyright, and trade secret litigation as well. And I'll turn it over to my partner here, Danielle. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Danielle Bolger. Um, I'm also a board member of the MBA's IP section. In addition to being an associate at Errant Fox, I counsel in the selection, registration, maintenance, portfolio management, enforcement of trademarks and copyrights in the U.S. and across the world. Um, I think we truly try and be business-focused IT attorneys, and I think we'll bring some of that to our discussion today, so I look forward to it. Thank you. So one other note on the National Bar Association, we bring time, for time to time uh, webinars like this uh, using different members, whether on the board or just people who are general parts of the membership, uh, to a wider audience of you in this audience today just for people's edification consists of people from the National Bar, uh, from the IP section, um, various clients and people interested in this uh, work um, from both law firms and the wider community as well. So thanks for joining. So let's get into the presentation. So today we're going to cover three main areas as part of our discussion in this area. First, as we talk about protecting brand value and identity in the e-commerce space, we're going to talk a little bit about trends, recent trends, and sort of what's brought us to this point in today. Next, we're going to cover some of the recent e-commerce related developments on the legal side, and we will then uh, actually move towards a Q&A section. We do have, and you'll see in the slides and the materials that you have, a section that covers protection strategies and leveraging IP registrations. It's a bit voluminous. It's really good information to have. That information actually will be covered at a subsequent webinar that the National Bar IP section will actually hold during our annual conference in late July. And we'll keep everyone uh, up to date on that with various emails that go to you all uh, after today's session via the uh, registration links and emails that you've provided. We also want to just let you all know that this agenda is not exhaustive, obviously, of all topics in e-commerce, but merely meant to help streamline our discussion today. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to Justin or myself. And with respect to questions, you'll see in the platform that you have and that you're participating in the webinar, feel free, obviously, to send things in through the chat function. We'll try to reserve about 10 minutes at the end of this presentation, roughly between 2.50 and 3 uh, p.m. Eastern, to address questions. So, trends in e-commerce. I think, you know, it goes without saying in terms of how almost all of us conduct ourselves with respect to interacting with brands, to just buying everyday goods that each and every one of us buys, either for luxury goods, either for everyday consumer products. You have to go through e-commerce. If you haven't, that's probably a very small minority of you know humans on the planet at this point. And it goes without saying that services traditionally performed in line are undoubtedly moving, excuse me, performed in person are now moving online. We see it in the food sector with various meal kits, including by Walmart, by Amazon, and Blue Apron. We see it in the transportation industry. You can now browse cars online, get approved for a loan, and choose to pick up your car, have it deliver delivered through Carvana, for instance. And also, personalized shopping assistants um, are increasingly becoming more popular online through chat box, for example, uh, which are used to enhance the shopping experience. So ultimately, all that to say, with these new business models, um, there are prone to be new and likely novel legal issues, and we're going to get into some of those. Right. One of those that is relevant and it's happening all around us, whether you see it, whether you hear about it, and whether, quite honestly, it's happening behind the scenes, 
is the impact of the application of artificial intelligence technologies. Absolutely, and it's, it's difficult to have a discussion in today's economy about e-commerce and IP without actually first touching on artificial intelligence or AI. AI is everywhere, particularly in the e-commerce space, and it affects how we live, how we work, how we entertain ourselves. And Justin, I think it's fair to say that we're not at the West World or ex machina level yet where computers are actually making connections and reaching meanings without relying on predefined behavioral algorithms. But as humans, we undoubtedly are fixated on improving life across every spectrum. At least I know I'm guilty of right. that, and we can use technology to help us do that. That's right. And AI in particular is something as a tool, even in its emerging state that it still is at now, is really directly attributable to how you interact with brands and goods. If you think about how, and we'll talk about it in a bit, people traditionally have gone to various types of stores and retail centers and been given suggestions on products. Now, if you think about it, many devices are passively watching and studying your interactions and behavior and learning how that you know, would help a company or a brand help them maximize their sales because they actually do better understand the consumer or you and how you interact with their brand. So I think it's fair to say that when most people think about AI and IP, uh, they often associate intellectual property and AI with patents. Um, but Artificial intelligence also has trademark implications, and as e-commerce continues to evolve, I think these historic principles of trademark law may no longer apply or they'll, be ha they'll have to be implemented differently. And to think about where we're going, I think it's important to just have an overview of where we've actually um, come, from where we've come, especially in the retail industry. So if you think about it, centuries ago, you could enter a shop and the product suggestion would actually be made by a shop assistant um, from products kept behind the counter. Then we moved to 1916 with Piggly Wiggly, which was a chain in Memphis, which removed the actual shop assistant and arguably, I think, increased consumer confusion. Um, then in 1990, we had this introduction of online retail, which presented new trademark challenges, particularly given this new business model. We started to see issues in, um, on the Internet with domain names, with keywords, with metadata, initial interest confusion, and the like. And a lot of these issues still remain today, and I think we'll discuss some of those. Um, social media presented new issues. Artificial intelligence, as you mentioned, um, and it's interesting, there's a study right. that we were talking about earlier, Justin. Right, uh, right, the Gartner study. And so it's kind of interesting that just a couple of years ago, Gartner, one of the well-known research and analytic houses out there, did a pretty comprehensive study on sort of the impacts of uh, AI. And the Gartner study, it's kind of funny, predicted that by 2020, which is really next year, <laughs> that 85% of customer service interactions in retail will be powered or influenced by some form of AI. And I think it's important to just let that sink in for a little bit because when we're talking about the law of trademarks and brands, think about how whether you're talking about the standard of it, which is likelihood of confusion, or just even at the broader sense that trademarks helps you govern how one interacts or identifies a source of a particular brand. And you think about how much of these interactions that we're having now and in the future are going to be powered in some sense by something that's not human. I think that's going to open up the world for a lot of different uh, con new considerations, new ways to think about what happens with respect to AI and trademarks. Another piece of that that I think is important to mention, though, and when you talk about trademark law and its core tenet being likelihood of confusion, is not only are humans interacting with the brands, but what about when computers are interacting with the brands? And what about when computers or robots or AI are interacting imperfectly. After all, a lot of the AI systems, and I think many people know this, whether you have technical background or not, oftentimes only act as good as the data sets or the behavior that they've been able to study and then go out and implement. So if you had sort of bad data in or bad behaviors in, oftentimes the output means imperfect or bad data or bad behavior by the AI or robot. So I think those are interesting issues to consider um, how those may play out legally in the future. Agreed, and I think we'll see more of that in the future and um, lots of business implications also, including with increased global revenue and, and generational 
differences with so many millennials appreciating brands who use AI. Right, right. One uh, bit that I'll add on here, which is kind of interesting, and uh, it's sort of a, a real case and, and something I've heard about in the news, but you could think about what's happened with items out there like Alexa or any of the other technologies that are deployed, let's say, passively in a phone or speaker. You know, it, oftentimes, depending on how you set these things, you could say, hey, Alexa, could you play dolls with me? And there's a case here where Alexa ordered a doll house and a bag of cookies, all triggered upon hearing that request. So, again, if you think about where technology is gone in that request, other than the computer responding to a verbal trigger, the entity that was actually making the purchasing decision there or the entity that would have had the likelihood of confusion was actually a robot or an AI bot. <laughs> That's pretty funny, and I'm, I'm curious to see how courts will actually uh, opine on some of these issues in the future, including uh, questions regarding who actually ordered the product and, and who was actually confused, whether it was the AI or the person. Right. So we'll move next into some of the other legal issues here in e-commerce. And in this section, just a little bit of, of pretext and preview. We're going to cover, obviously, some different situations where we see you know, current trends in e-commerce. I'll talk about some applications and instances that we see in the business world now and some stories, you know, at least in terms of trends that we see from clients. Obviously, this being a CLE session, we'll also be talking about the law that relates to some of this. Our first topic is keywords and metadata. In the past, I think it's fair to say that the main issues concerning online keywords and metadata have related to the actual purchase of another's trademark for advertising space. And as some of you out there may know, search engines generate income by selling advertising space on their search results pages. Essentially, these ads are triggered by the search term or keyword input by the computer user. Um, in addition, companies, as we all know, because we use Internet every day, uh, use pop-up advertising, whereby an advertisement pops up on the screen and a computer user accesses a website. All that to say, in legal cases in the past, um, plaintiffs typically have made an initial interest confusion argument. They claim that the defendant's use of their trademark was likely to cause initial interest confusion, for example, and ultimate harm. In other words, when a web shopper, for instance, inserts the trademark owner's trademark, then sees a results page with an advertisement for a competitor, the web shopper is somehow confused about whether the competitor is affiliated or connected with the trademark owner. But <laughs> as we'll right. see... Almost all district courts yes, yeah. have found that no likelihood of confusion was caused by the actual purchase of keywords alone. Right. And so it's an interesting point that despite how I think many people, and if you step back a bit from where we are now, even just think a few years ago, let's say eight, ten years ago, I think it was probably surprising to a lot of people that courts wouldn't find a likelihood of confusion there. But what that really means is that likelihood of confusion or use of purchasing another's keywords, at least in and of itself, per se, is not uh, something that should be infringement. But as we know in the law, everything has a but, a caveat. <laughs> There's some sort of gray area, and I think we especially see this in the Rosetta Stone case. Um, there may be liability where a trademark owner can show that the particular search returns or sponsored keyword advertisements are actually likely to cause confusion based on the specific use or presentation of the trademark. So in Rosetta Stone, the Fourth Circuit reversed and remanded uh, a summary dismissal, actually, in which the district court had originally dismissed an unjust enrichment claim against Google for using the plaintiff's language Language learning software, isn't that funny? It's actually That's language, right. language learning. <laughs> learning software. Anyway, um, the court found ultimately that there were triable issues of fact on direct and contributory infringement and dilution. Now, this actually seems to uh, be contrary to what we just discussed, but here the court pointed to actual evidence of consumers who purchased counterfeit and fake Rosetta Stone marked software uh, 
From the actually, sponsored link. Yeah, yeah from the right. actual sponsored link. And I'm laughing because uh, in the actual opinion, one of the participants who was confused, he was actually in the software industry, and he ended up buying this fake Rosetta right. Stone product. Right. So it goes to show that anyone can really be confused no matter your level of sophistication. Right. Um, in addition, the court highlighted Google's in-house studies, which showed that likelihood of confusion remained high when trademarks were used in the title or body of an ad. Um, in addition, the court pointed to Google's purported allowance of known infringers who actually bid on Rosetta Stone marks as keywords. In sum, there was sufficient evidence for the court to conclude that there were questions of fact on each of the disputed factors, and as we know, what trademark law these include, intent and actual confusion and consumer sophistication, and ultimately, um, this precluded summary judgment. This case was settled back in November 2012. Right. So just to give you a little background, we can fast forward to some more recent cases. Right. And so one case and why I think we will deal with this here is the multi-time machines versus Amazon. Obviously, Amazon is one of the more popular e-commerce platforms, and I think because this case it was dealt with in the Ninth Circuit in 2015. It's it's worth talking about here. And this really dealt with the issue is that, you know, if you're a brand owner or if you think about being a brand owner, what if a consumer is searching for your brand on Amazon or some other platform, but, but you as a brand owner don't actually sell your goods to that platform? And that's what this particular case dealt with here. Here in particular, just to go through some of the notes on this, the plaintiff – in this particular case, didn't sell its watches on Amazon.com, but it sued Amazon for trademark infringement because the list of competitors that's returned when a customer searched for a plaintiff's trademark on that website. So bottom line is if you were able to search on it, you would see uh, that particular brand's results there, even though they didn't sell the watches on that particular uh, e-commerce platform. So... The Ninth Circuit in this case, or let me go back, the district court here granted summary judgment in favor of Amazon, and the Ninth Circuit affirmed. In this case, primarily for two reasons. First, because Amazon's search results page clearly labeled the name and manufacturer of each of the products offered for sale and even included photographs of those items, according to the court. And the court really reasoned here that no reasonably prudent consumer accustomed to shopping online would likely be confused as to the source of the products. And, of course, they're looking at that saying, okay, you've got the name of the manufacturer plus the photograph of the item. With respect to intent or the issue of whether there was sort of bad intent here, the court found that the likelihood of confusion factor really didn't weigh in the plaintiffs, the plaintiff being multi-time machine's favor, because here Amazon had designed its page or result page to alleviate any possible confusion about the source of the products by clearly labeling each of its products with the product's name and manufacturer. And so in that situation, uh, the court really fell on the side of the e-commerce platform and not the brand owner. And I think this case is interesting and, and the next few that we'll discuss because especially as practitioners, we represent clients on, on both ends, right? So right. the platforms themselves and also brand owners who may be selling on these third party right. marketplaces and therefore we're faced with these difficult questions. What actually happens when someone else uses your trademark? And whereas before Absolutely. it was um we had to deal with issues with respect to search engines, now we actually see brands becoming marketplaces right. and presenting new problems. That's um, right. That's so right. There's actually another similar case, Justin, in which a plaintiff requested a preliminary injunction concerning uh, the defendant's use of its trademark, and this was recently decided by the Western District uh, Washington. of Washington right. back in, in March. So there the plaintiff... Co Comfy Company uh, sought a preliminary injunction to prevent Amazon from using its Comfy mark, and plaintiff refused to sell its Comfy branded bedding linen on Amazon's website. Right. Their reasoning was, we want to maintain our, our brand. We don't want to third, sell through third-party sites. Right. Uh, therefore, we choose not to. All that to say, 
a search for comfy sheets return products similar to this plaintiff's product, including bedding offered for sale by comfy. Ultimately, the court denied the plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction, reasoning that it wasn't clear that the plaintiff actually had a valid, protectable trademark in Comfy. Its registration was actually for a mark which incorporated a design, so not a standard character mark. Um, In addition, their goods were limited to linens and bedding for health spas. This is also significant because the plaintiff itself essentially limited um, their potential, yeah, the scope of their potential customers um, in protection. Comfy also does not necessarily identify source. I mean, here, when we think of distinctiveness in this context, Comfy appears to be more descriptive than suggestive, um, particularly as it relates to sheets and bedding um, and describes the quality of the product, right, that the bedding itself was actually comfortable. And so overall, the court didn't view the plaintiff's use of Comfy as an overly strong mark and admitted that this wasn't an easy decision, um, but based on the facts, it had to deny the plaintiff's motion. Right. And one just sort of sort of practice note or maybe trend here that you see, despite, you know, you see some of these recent rulings here that we've covered, and this is just a smattering of what's out there. What we're sort of seeing in practice is these are real issues. We've moved from the search engines where obviously people still have some issues when a, a competitor buys buys keywords, particularly if it turns out it's not really a competitor, it's someone directing someone to counterfeit products. But here in the platforms, it's a bit deeper. You're going sometimes into a bit of a, a vertical, if you want to use that term, within the e-commerce platform world. And I think you're still going to have a number of brands, whether it's comfy with sheets and bed linings, whether it's an MTM with, with watches. I think you're still going to see a number of companies that have built up and invested in their brands, particularly those who want to sell exclusive products that are high-end, who will have to make a real tough decision. Do I get on a particular e-commerce platform or not? If I'm not on it, how much am I watching and monitoring it for various trademark abuses or situations like we've just talked about in these two cases? And that's something that's not going away anytime soon. I agree. And and just as a quick note, since we have it up here, um, you all may have seen that the Federal Trade Commission also recently opined on this invisible fight involving keywords and third-party marks. Um, Specifically, late last year, the FTC, they issued a three-to-one decision, uh, and it held that 1-800-CONTACTS had violated Section 5 of the FTC Act. And as some of you may know, this is the act which essentially prohibits unfair or deceptive acts and practices in or affecting commerce. And as background, 1-800, say, 1-800 contacts, they had entered into a series of trademark infringement settlement agreements in which its competitors were required to limit their internet search keyword um, bidding and advertising. The commission found that the agreements actually limited truthful internet advertising in response to the keyword searches. In essence, they ultimately uh, issued an order which prohibited 1-800-CONTACTS from enforcing these unlawful provisions. And they reasoned that these actual provisions in these settlement agreements restricted consumers' ability to price compare or uh, to price comparison shop, as they said in quotes, uh, between competing suppliers of contact lenses. If that's confusing, just to break it down a little bit, 1-800-CONTACTS, said in their settlement agreements that these third parties could not use 1-800-CONTACTS as a keyword in their actual uh, searches. Uh, They could not bid on 1-800-CONTACTS, and the FTC found this was actually restricting consumers' ability to price shop, and so 1-800-CONTACTS is now or is in the process of appealing this decision, and I think this will be something to watch because it has a lot of trademark owners up in arms about how they can actually uh, right. restrict third parties of their trademarks. Right. right. It's part of that age-old debate, just new front. On the one hand, the brand owners are concerned about things like quality control and making sure people associate a brand with the investment that company or brand owner has made. But then you always have that intention with, uh, you know, public interest in terms of allowing a lot of people to compete 
And when you give the trademark monopoly, making sure that it's not so broad in scope that you're preventing others from being able to refer to, to items of, of commerce in the way that people naturally would or letting others do business fairly in, in another area. So that's always going to be fought out in every different medium and uh, no different here. So some takeaways here uh, on the aspects of keywords and uh, just a few points in terms of, you know, if you, if you don't hear anything else, maybe take these, these three or four points away. Um, but basically, when you're creating new brands, as we kind of saw in the Comfy case, one factor that sometimes can go against you if you're a brand owner is how distinctive was your mark. The more distinctive, the more likely you are to prevail. It was certainly a factor there that ran against Comfy. Uh, and it's sued against Amazon. Additionally, if you wish to purchase another party's trademark for online advertising space, don't otherwise use the third party mark. And I think we especially saw that in Rosetta Stone where Rosetta Stone's mark was actually being used in the actual third party links. Um, if you want to use someone else's trademark, just use it, but don't actually use it in your actual advertising. Um, this was also discussed in network automation. We didn't talk about it here. Right. Um, but essentially, likelihood of confusion will ultimately turn on what the consumer saw on the screen and reasonably believed given the context. Right. And then I think last but not least, and this was sort of the cautionary tale of what's happening with the 1-800 uh, contacts case in the FTC, but a practice point, just narrowly draft settlement agreements in this area so that you avoid unfair competition claims. So next we're going to talk about trademark infringement and counterfeiting in general online. And as one of my favorite designers once said, if you want to be original, be ready to be copied. That was by the late Coco Chanel. Um, so Justin, I think we could actually spend an entire CLE on infringing and counterfeit goods, but here I think the point is just to simply right. touch on some facts and strategies for policing your IP online. Absolutely. So here, uh, it's interesting when you hit this topic, because it is a, this is a big trend, and it hasn't gone away. So whether you go back 30 or 40 years ago and you're talking uh, when people would just go to a store and buy hard goods or when you're talking about the majority of products coming in um, container ships and containers and then going through ports and customs, we're obviously in a different world with the proliferation of e-commerce where most people are buying things that are coming to them in some drop ship mode. They're coming through things like FedEx or various other express mail and courier services. They're micro shipments and it's something that's much more dispersed than it ever has been. So it's very tough if you think about counterfeits and infringing goods or even just unsafe goods from the standpoint of those who are uh, law authorities who work in customs, their job is tougher than ever. You can't just go to a container or a container ship and find all the products in one big bin. They're coming through different medium. They're coming through air, land, sea. They're coming in onesies and twosies. And so what that means on the enforcement side, quite honestly, is it's tougher than ever that also from a company standpoint presents a number of you all who are known on this call and a number of the clients that we deal with with an interesting quandary. How much money do you spend um, trying to interface with all the different government agencies or maybe your own private investigators and legal team in stopping shipments that you do find out about that might be of counterfeits? That's a common topic that comes up in, in real life. It's not talked about so much in a legal sense but it's a real factor in, in the sense that, that companies, although many will say, hey, counterfeiting of our product is not good and we wouldn't like it to happen, run up on the practical implications of do I chase every one, two, or three items that are counterfeit that are out there that we find. It's become increasingly tough, to make a long story short, to make the zero tolerance policies that a lot of people like to talk about actually true and real in a real way because of the proliferation of e-commerce. So I think it's an important point to make here. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, whereas before we were only seeing counterfeit goods at the border, we're also now seeing them online. I mean, they're third-party websites that are actually selling these goods and, and some legitimate sites too, right? Sometimes, right. especially if you have these uh, 
consumers who are uploading pictures and, and claiming to sell authentic goods, right. those actually may not be authentic. Right. So right. new challenges all around, I agree. Right. I think, you know, you can look at the stats here. We're not going into all the stats and trying to read the numbers to you, but I think this is a good slide in terms of just showing sort of the gravity of the problem. When you're talking about counterfeit goods or infringing goods online and all the different flavors of that, it's like trying to measure any other aspect of crime. The, the measures can be imprecise, and sometimes they're guesstimates at best. If you're a particular brand and you know your product or your widget is being knocked off, you perhaps more than anyone actually has a, have a good sense of what that may be, but even still may have a challenge in terms of saying, like, what's the dollar value of that? That's a, another trend and another bit of difficulty that we often see come up in this area I would like to at least take the moment to say, though, that when that happens and when people sort of struggle with this and say, hey, it's a tough topic, it's not an excuse for not enforcing your IP and trying to value it. I think uh, the effort to try to estimate the impact, negative impacts of counterfeiting are always valuable because it gives you a better idea of how not just your consumers that are interacting, at interacting with your brand, but very crafty counterfeiters or those who are watching the things that make your brand or product special. And there's a lot of knowledge to be gained to that. And in our practices here, we've often seen that companies that invest in brand protection and anti-counterfeiting activities learn a lot that's really invaluable in terms of how they innovate future versions of products. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, another sort of practice and business point to bring up. Agreed. So obviously today a big piece of this has been the e-commerce space and nowhere else other than some of the big platforms, we'll talk a little bit about eBay and Amazon today, you'll see how different of these platforms have kind of responded to the increasing um, prevalence or at least the increased threat of, of, of counterfeit or have dealing with infringing goods on their platform. And one, as you can see in the slide, and it's gotten a lot of notoriety over the years, is eBay's Verified Rights Owner Program or Bureau. In short, you know, it's their system and process by which you would report listings uh, and different items that you see, um, particularly as a brand owner, that infringe your intellectual property. Um, that covers things like counterfeits, covers things like replicas, unauthorized copyrighted content um, that's on a listing or product page. And What's, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was yeah. going to add, in addition, um, this program is actually significant to some of our brand owners because it's in addition to reporting an alleged copyright infringement via the Digital, digital Millennium Copyright Act. So right. it serves as a nice complement when you want to right. enforce your IP rights online. That's a great point. And actually, when you think about that, as much as I think this is useful and services like this can be useful, it's tough for them to be a cure-all. And there certainly are areas that they, meaning in this case, if we talk about eBay and the Vero program, areas where you can't report various listings. And so you might be able to even figure out from some of the things we've talked about before where that could be. But certainly, if you're reporting listings because you're trying to enforce contracts, uh, particularly around distribution of goods to authorize sellers, any sort of selective distribution request where you're trying to get the platform to do that on your behalf, those are often outright not accepted or certainly not responded to. Um, enforcement or asking the Bureau program to sort of help when it comes to not allowing sales of items that are below MAP or minimum advertised pricing. Um, any terms a brand puts in their contracts that control the way items are even resold, again, fall in that sort of contractual issues area, and that's typically something that you would not be able to report, um, at least through the Bureau program. One last point on this eBay program. Uh, we often hear, and I'm sure you hear this a lot too, Justin, right. brand owners are always curious about how they can let consumers know that a particular mark is actually a mark. They may be concerned about a mark becoming generic, about right. um, how consumers are using their mark, um, for example, if they're not using it as a mark. and right eBay actually allows their verified rights owners to create a profile page which allows the brand owner to share information about their rights with uh, the eBay community. And I think we've seen all different sorts of advertisements for this. Um, right. Brand owners can be creative in how they let 
consumers know that they have IP rights, they are willing to enforce them, and, and how their marks are intended to be used. Right. And I think uh, a lot of brand owners have used that type of tactic, whether it's with the Bureau program or other e-commerce platform providers, to be creative. And one of the best practices that we've seen in uh, recent years, and even some years back, were brand owners that took the time to create really good product guides where they put out some of the information that they had and some of the information they had learned over time when they compared their particular product to various knockoffs or replicas that they had seen and try to arm consumers with some of the differences between, you know, pictures of authentic product and pictures of various types or versions of counterfeit. Now, obviously, that can work both ways. Some companies will then say, look, we can do some of that, but not all. I don't want to be in the business of educating the very people who are knocking off my products. But there are a lot of different ways where you can talk to your consumers through guides and use the different avenues that the e-commerce platforms give you as a brand owner to talk about and educate consumers on how to interact with your product. And just like interacting with your trademark and saying it the right way is important, making sure people can distinguish between an authentic and a counterfeit good is a worthy investment as well. So another um, program like this, we've got a slide here for Amazon's brand registry. New, newer program, uh, I think it's become very popular. We've definitely seen a lot of requests to be involved in this and a lot of interaction from various brand owners in terms of how to get more involved with the Amazon brand registry. So we thought it'd be worthwhile, obviously, to have a quick slide summarizing this. But in a sense, the Amazon brand registry allows IP owners to protect their registered trademarks on Amazon. I think making sure people understand it's for the registered marks and not marks that are pending or or that are common law or, or in some way um, not established and registered is an important distinction. But the bottom line requirements there is you've got to have an active registered mark that appears on your product or packaging. And the ability, obviously, as you can imagine the fraud level here, uh, and fraud concerns, but you know you have to have the ability to verify yourself as the owner or the authorized agent uh, for trademarks, and obviously as a brand owner, have an Amazon account. There's some good benefits here. I think one, it helps you quite honestly just be on the fast track of getting a response and be having Amazon involved in the problem or your problem as a brand owner of dealing with with knockoffs or counterfeits, so there's nothing better than to take advantage of a platform's program. I think you get access to some pretty good tools there, which include their proprietary tech and tools for searching through various text and image search. There's some auto, you know, automated searches that will happen um, based on your reports of suspected IP right violations, and that would be going on sometimes even separate from, from what you are reporting. And so there's real value to, to participating in that program. Agreed. So next, we briefly want to just discuss some uh, hot topics and issues with domain names. Uh, we were previously discussing counterfeit products, and I think it's fair to say that sometimes infringing products are also linked to an infringing domain name and website. Uh, one thing to note, and what I think a lot of people forget sometimes, is that use of a trademark in a domain name uh, alone is not actionable usually. You typically need something more to give rise to an infringement or a cyber squatting cause of action. Um, as brief background, a cyber squatter is a person who knowingly obtains from a registrar, as you all see on the screen, a domain name consisting of the trademark of the company for the purpose of ransom, typically, um, and they seek to use that trademark uh, to essentially get the trademark owner to buy back any right. sort of rights they may have. Right. Um, there are multiple ways to combat these cyber squatting issues. One is through the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act. It's also known as ACPA and the Uniform Domain Name uh, Dispute Resolution Policy, also known as the EDRP proceeding. And more recently, we're seeing cases with URS, which we'll discuss in a little more detail, too. Generally, the ACPA uh, creates civil liability for cyber squatting. As you'll see on the screen, these are some elements that a plaintiff needs to plead 
uh, in an ACPA case. One recent case involving the ACPA was actually brought by the estate of Prince Rogers, who we know as Prince, um, against domain name capital. This was a case from last year. And so the complaint alleged that domain capital provided a leaseback program where an owner of a domain sells the digital property to the company and the company then leases it back, uh, essentially like a privacy screen. So there was a level of heightened privacy for the original owner. Ultimately, this website itself didn't return a result. In other words, when you go to prince.com, uh, there was no underlying website, but the estate essentially requested immediate and permanent injunctive relief, transfer of the domain name, damages, and attorney fees. According to the docket, this case appears to have settled um, a few months ago in, in March, but one notable right. ACPA case is actually, or actually involved um, the infamous Donald Trump, and this one was in the Eastern District of New York. And so in this case, um, Donald Trump brought a, an action against Taekwok Young under the ACPA. Um, Young had actually bought many domain names such as Trump Beijing and Trump, Trump Mumbai, um, but he had actually never used Trump in his business, um, and his business was actually unrelated to, I feel weird saying Donald Trump, should I say the president? At the, the time, he wasn't the president. Um, anyway, Young had purchased the domain names and uh, they included Trump Mumbai in India, and shortly after, the Trump Mark registrant had announced real estate developments in India. All that to say, there had previously been an announcement that there were going to be new properties in India and Mumbai, among other places, and this third party registered these domain names. The court found that Young had engaged and a bad faith attempt as a cyber squatter to profit from the Trump mark, and I think it's clear to see why they found right. that way. Right. So in addition to litigation in federal courts, parties can also use the UDRP um, or the URS system to pursue cyber squatting or cyber uh, piracy claims, actually. As background, the UDRP is a global is a kind of global arbitration um, of cyber squatting disputes under I ICANN. Uh, the process is streamlined. It usually takes 60 to 70 days. The trademark owner files a UDRP complaint with the arbitration provider. Uh, they serve the domain name registrant. They notify the registrar. And the arbitration provider verifies that payment has been made and the complaint complies with the UDRP rules. The, uh, the respondent then has 20 days to file an answer. All this to say it's, it's an easy way to, right. um, to combat someone who's using your domain name and typically something else right. Right. in an infringing manner. Right. So we go through the UDRP and, and background generally to note that we're now seeing cases or case law concerning reverse domain name hijacking. So as, as much as our clients actually want to file UDRP proceedings to get a third party to stop using their mark, um, I think it's important to note that as brand owners, we have to do homework. We have to encourage right. our clients to do their homework to ensure that any such proceeding is not initiated in bad faith. Um, and there was actually a recent case that came down uh, last year, and in this case, uh, Long story short, there was a registrant. He registered yish.com. Um, Wang had actually previously filed a trademark application and subsequently got a registration a year later for yish. <clears throat> at some point during the filing of, excuse me, at some point after the filing of the complaint, uh, Wang and his business partner decided to wind up their business. They contacted the arbitration forum asking to withdraw uh, their complaint and to terminate the UDRP proceeding, but the registrant had actually objected. He had already filed an answer, and he said, why do you want to <laughs> pull out now? And it's important to note here that UDRP rules only allow for termination if it becomes unnecessary or impossible to continue the proceeding. And here, 
it was neither unnecessary or impossible. And overall, the form found that the complainants had engaged in reverse domain name hijacking. In essence, he filed his complaint well knowing that the disputed domain name had registered many years before his actual use commenced. And here that's important because, as we know, trademark rights are based on use. And so if there's another third party who's actually using the same or substantially similar, in this case an identical mark, um, you don't have prior rights. This person actually would have had prior rights. And the arbitration forum actually... uh, or WIPO noted that Mr. Wang should have known that he couldn't prevail, and therefore they found that his complaint was brought in bad faith. Right. I, one, or I guess a couple of thoughts, you know, just on this. We've talked a little bit about UDRP, domain name enforcement, and this most recent sort of uh, incident have reversed domain name hijacking. Uh, a couple of takeaways I think that are important there uh, are, do your homework regardless of sort of what side of the battle feel you're on on this. I think one is when it comes to looking at these cases, if you're going to be successful in domain name enforcement and you're a brand owner, you really do have to focus hard and spend a little time and resource and due diligence on is there bad faith or are there examples of bad faith use on behalf of the person. Uh, you can look at the Trump case where Maybe as part of your business, you are regularly announcing things before you do them. You're trying to stir up the press and and hike up a lot of um, publicity around a real estate opening. You do that with with widgets and products and electronics, all types of things, where oftentimes, as a matter of course, you may issue out press releases. It's amazing in this day and age, as much as you see people coordinating marketing and uh, trying to generate PR, that many brand owners and companies still don't think to either one, just preventatively try to lock up those domain names ahead of time, two, make sure they've thought through the trademark strategy before you make your announcement about the product or or item or real estate location or whatever it may be. But those are just some basic thoughts that I think are important to share to make sure that you're reminding clients and, and, and yourselves to do. And then last but not least, um, the moment where these kind of processes, and I say this uh, just an experience, a lot of companies, a lot of law firms do a lot, a high number of these UDRP proceedings. It's easy to kind of lull yourself into a certain sense of security that they are generally going to come out on the side of the, the brand owner and can lend themselves to this sort of repetitive scenario where you don't do your homework. And so in this reverse domain name hijacking case, I think this is a, a, a great sort of cautionary tale in why you still want to do your due diligence in each and every one of these proceedings. They may not be that high cost. They may be something that's perceived to be arbitration, but it still carries liability. Agreed. And lastly, we just wanted to touch on the uniform registration system. This is a relatively new system. I think it's important to note that it only applies to GTLDs or CCTLDs. Um, The criteria is similar to a UDRP, but there's a higher burden of proof. I'm actually surprised that this hasn't been as popular as people thought it would be, but I think it's because of the higher burden of proof, and and maybe um, we'll see more of these complaints being filed, but so far I'm just surprised we haven't. Right, right. I, I, I share that. I think there... There may be one reason, though. I think if you think about some of the different terms you, you could use, dot .buzz, dot .guru, dot .ventures, there's a whole nother, you know, cornucopia of names you could come up with that would come under a global or country code type top level domains. And so once I think, quite honestly, people moved out of just dot .com, dot .net, dot .org, I think it's become so voluminous for people to kind of get their heads around of what am I doing in each of these different constructs that they tend to just opt for what's the most simple route. And they're just not thinking about, you know, when would I go do a uniform registration system proceeding. Something that's important, though, and it could be a great tool, and it's good that the framework is there, and I think time will tell if it gets used more. I think so, and maybe this will encourage third parties to actually register their marks first, especially since you cannot bring a claim under common law rights only um, with the URS. Right. So another area when you're talking about sort of e-commerce and where things are going that we'd be remiss without mentioning is social media. And uh, we'll uh, move through this kind of quickly. I think 
obviously everyone's inundated with all types of social media. It, we don't need to sort of go into to really what it is. But I think one important piece that we do want to convey here is that with social media or the rise of any of the new emerging types of media, there are just more avenues for you to interact with consumers around your brand. And so you'll see whether it's lawyers like us, various people in the marketing and, and branding community that are experts using terms like brand identity, I think you're going to see a trend of that happening more and more. And that's quite simply all it really refers to all the different ways consumers engage with your brand, whether it's on different platforms, whether it's real world, whether it's through your logos, your color scheme, the feeling people get, that overall arching user experience that people would attach to your brand name and to your company is something called brand identity. Agreed. And I, I know we have some cases here um, that are actually pretty significant. Um, we may just want to yeah, uh, we could pass through just okay. for the sake of time here. I think just the point for these, and obviously people can read the slides, and that's why we've got a lot of this good material here for you. But the point here is that we've spent a lot of time talking about trademarks and branding. As part of your brand identity, it's all obviously content. And where is content king the most these days, if not on music and film? It often happens in online social media. And so the next few slides cover some very interesting cases, very recent cases, that all bring up different points where I think they focus around content and copyrightability and all the different flavors of how that can be disputed um, when dealing with blogs or any of the different social media channels that have become very popular. I agree. I think one uh, takeaway from the Goldman versus Breitbart case is think twice about retweeting an image or a video. Um, Copyright law is evolving, and courts are attempting to apply its reach to new mediums. But when you're just grabbing content from the Internet, I think it's also important to do your due diligence. In this case, uh, the actual image in dispute was not a public image. Um, right. We've been on the other side recently as practitioners uh, arguing that there is a very narrow scope that should be applied to this case. It should not be applied broadly, and, and so I think this is a case we should pay attention to. Um, next we have right. Pop Sugar. The Pop Sugar, I, I think just the key issue here, it's obviously, again, dealt with content. And here, it actually dealt with uh, a complaint alleging Pop Sugar had copied thousands of different influencers' Instagram pages. That's obviously another trend and thing where you see more and more people posting different aspects of their lives or people pitching products in different ways and kind of showing that they have a certain lifestyle. Obviously, imagery and content drives that sort of business. So again, when you're in the business of featuring that on a platform uh, as, a, as a Pop Sugar it's something where you've got to constantly be aware of the fact that you've got copyright implications there. You have people's personal likeness there and rights of publicity issues that are separate and apart from copyright as well. And those are key issues that, again, they're not going away, and we actually see this proliferating in terms of a claim that's being brought. I agree. One last note on this case. I think it's interesting to note that the court acknowledged that the sidebar that you see on Instagram can actually constitute CMI or copyright management information. Um, and the court actually found that one can plausibly infer that the removal of the CMI um, would help to conceal infringement and therefore that can be actionable. So be careful again what you're reposting right. and what you're removing in those reposts. Right, good point. Reposting and retweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, this is a big point again, and I can't emphasize this or overemphasize it enough. It seems simple, but it comes up almost all the time. If you're going to assert any rights in content, let's hope, particularly if you're the content owner or the company trying to leverage it, that you have already applied for and registered the underlying copyright in that content. Agreed. This was a huge case that was decided by the Supreme Court just a few months ago, and, and they said exactly that. You must have a copyright registration in order to bring a copyright infringement suit. It's not sufficient to simply have a pending application. Um, and they also noted in this case that in limited circumstances, copyright owners can file an infringement suit before 
uh, having a registration, but again, very limited circumstances, and I would argue that it probably doesn't apply to most plaintiffs. Absolutely, and certainly not something you should plan on going into, uh, at least trying to or planning on going into something like this without having your copyright registered. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap things up, some key takeaways. Uh, obviously, the Internet and e-commerce continues to uh, be popular issues. Right. Uh, both of those are popular issues, excuse me, um, but the fundamental legal issues are still the same. Right. And I think all the belt and suspenders approaches that you have come to know and learn in, in your profession certainly do. I think uh, the one often question we get in these, and it leads to one of the takeaways, is if you are quivering a bit or wavering on whether I should retweet or repost something or can I use this person's photo for this on this blog or can I take this from here and there, almost always that answer is no unless you are just budgeting a lot of money for that inevitable lawsuit. And lastly, as we just discussed, when in doubt, register. I think this applies to copyrights, but also trademarks, trade dress. Um, you all will receive a copy of the slides and we talk more about those benefits of registering and, and how you can actually um, use different forms of IP to protect your rights online. Right. So if there are any questions, uh, I suspect people have already been sending them in. Looks like we've got a few here. But this is the time to ask. If we do not get to your question, we'll certainly use the tool and platform here to uh, get back to you with our answers. Thank, thank you. So a couple of questions here. And I'll read off the list we have. I think the first question we got is a good one. What is the court standard used in the likelihood of confusion cases regarding search terms and trademarks? Is it a type of reasonable person standard? with all age and dem demographics using online searches, seems sophistication of the consumer varies widely? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know, what, what do you think? Is, is likelihood of confusion something that would be like a reasonable person standard? If, given that we do have such a wide variety of people on the internet yeah, that, are, and I that think are interacting. It, agreed, I, I think it depends on the type of case. So if we're talking about right. keywords, again, um, you can actually use a third party's trademark, um, but you have to be careful on how it's used. You can't actually right. display the mark. Right. Um, I think it's a great question. I, my The way I would sort of take this is that I don't know that it's a reasonable person standard. I think you heard some of the cases we talked about earlier where context, I think, is key. And so uh, two things hit me here. One is sort of context when the user is on that particular screen what, what is the person's impression? Is it being used on a purchase page? Is it being used around similar products? Is it something that, I don't want to call it a reasonable person, but maybe a modern online shopper who's looking for that type of good would would come away with a conclusion on? Maybe that's probably the best way um, to articulate that. I don't know that a court has gone to that level of detail, but I think that's a great question. And that's an area where I know firsthand a lot of argumentation happens on both sides when it gets to that point in court about the context and about who might be, uh, let's say, the market segment that's relevant to that analysis. And just to add on to that, I think courts have actually also struggled with this because right. they note that um, the trade channels are obviously identical. If you're using someone else's trademark, well, obviously the marks are similar. So... Again, it just depends. Right. So another question here that we have, I'll read off. How are damages determined in the infringement of counterfeit goods of a trademark? Is it based on the profits gained by the infringing party or some other value with reference to the brand owner's valuation? That's great. I mean, so counterfeit, there's a couple different things here. So there are there is a, a law for trademark counterfeiting that gives statutory damages and there's no calculations that needs to be made. It's a set amount. Um, when it comes to trademark infringement, however, not in sort of the criminal context, 
I think it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Especially under 43A, um, under the Lanham Act, you can actually seek to get the uh, infringer's profits. For example, if someone was selling infringing goods, you can actually seek damages in the form of that third party's profits. Right. Okay, and then the third question we have here, in cases of bad faith, as in the Trump case, or the reverse domain name hijacking bad faith, what type of damages are usually levied against the party making a claim in bad faith? That's interesting. So one, I would say right off the bat, it, it's probably, the two that are important. One, obviously, if that happens, you're going to lose the case. You're out, obviously, your fees. Remember, these are generally in like an arbitration context. I think there's another cost here, though, and I quite honestly would say it's sort of reputational um, that may even be more than what you've invested or the other parties invested. Let's say on average, I think the average GDRP might be around $5,000. I think quite honestly, your reputation might be worth more than $5,000. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people aren't necessarily seeking damages, right? The whole idea is you get the domain name transferred or canceled, and you may not be able to do that by simply approaching the third party. That's why you file a UDRP proceeding. That's right. Okay. That looks like it for questions that we can see. Uh, Thanks for joining. If there are other questions, we have our names and contact information up on the slides. Please feel free to reach out to us with comments, questions, uh, points, anything. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, have a good afternoon.